we got our special guest. I mean, very, I'm, where'd he go? There he is. Hey. See. And he's the, the Debian project leader, the guy in charge of the whole thing, okay? Thank you. Oh, good afternoon. Lovely to see everyone hear me okay? Great. Lovely to see so many people here again. Um, of course, can only start with greetings from um, a hot and humid um, Taiwan. Um, and, well, anyway, thank you very much for inviting me and, and to the local organization team. Um, perhaps that can be done on the microphone? Ah. Um, yes, very much a hot and humid Taiwan. I mean, on that subject, I um, was recovering after my second shower of the day in my room, um, sort of half falling asleep, you know, in sort of, sort of afternoon haze. And I um, was suddenly awoken by a, um, it sounded like a bird stuck somewhere, or maybe on a balcony. What's, okay, what's going on? And, and um, in, it was quite insistent, uh, you know, about half a minute later, heard the same bird, you know, what, what's going on? Then I realized it was, it seemed to be coming from the wall just behind me. So maybe there's sort of panels and pipes coming through the wall, um, and there's a bird who's got stuck in there. I've heard it happen before. So I um, call on the concierge telephone saying, there seems to be, seems to be a bird stuck in the wall. It, it, you know, it's making these sort of loud sounds. What, can, you, can you see what's going on? Sure, certainly, sir. We'll send someone up. Um, wait about five minutes, doze off again, and um, the bird kicks off again, and no one had come up. So I ring back, terribly sorry, terribly disturbed. Um, the, the bird seems to be here, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, did no one come up? No, okay. We'll send someone up straight away, no problem. Again, sort of, sort of fall off in the, in the humidity. And uh, wake up again, uh, woken up by the bird again. What, what, hang on, what's going on? Like, um, hi, yeah, really sorry to disturb you, but the bird seems to be there, and it actually seems to be quite distressed. I mean, I don't think he can get out and things like that. I'm really sorry about this, sir, I don't know what happened. Uh, we sent someone up, I don't, I, I'll, I'll come up myself right away. Wait a few more minutes, um, again, just you know, hacking away or something. And um, still, no, no, no one comes. No, uh, and I'm just thinking, what, okay, what, what's really going on here? So I call for the final time. I, okay, I'm just, I, I'm going to go back to the, the venue now. But um, yeah, no one's come up. I don't know what's going on. Have you got the right room number? And um, they're like, oh. I'm sorry, sir, um, just for a second, just checking. You do know that our doorbell chimes are birdsong. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Anyway, greetings from, lovely to see you, so many people here. Um, great. Um, so, I mean, every time I stand up here or I'm around Debian, uh, developers, I get this question. So, um, what's it like being DPL? Um, it's almost a, sort of a, almost a cliched question. I'm never really sure how to, how to answer it really. I mean, because obviously people are, when people ask these questions, they're sometimes looking for an answer, or maybe I don't want to put them off running themselves. Um, but it's it's very difficult to answer because it's not really a position that has any parallel in any other free software project, I think. I mean, you can, I can just make jokes all day about it. I mean, Debian project leader, um, what outsiders think I do. I mean, if you speak to other people, they think, oh, it's just me, you know, decreeing that I think uh, we're going to use this thing over here, and uh, you're going to do this, or you're going to do this. Um, um, what other Debian developers think I do? I mean, everyone thinks I travel the world like some sort of itinerant something or other. Um, yeah, uh, what my parents think I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, probably is true, indeed. Um, what do the distributions think I do? <laughs> <laughs> or at least think what we do, anyway, yeah. Um, what I think I do. You know. 
I'm, I'm the, the, the boss, the uh, head, head honcho. Um, but what I really do is read and read and read a lot of email and things like that. Um, yeah, so yeah, memes always lighten the day. And I can also deflect the question with humor, which I've done here and referenced self-referentially so I can get away with it as well. Um, so what, what, what is the DPL? What is the project leader? I mean, um, is it a dictator? Well, no. I mean, in our constitution, we say, we explicitly state that you, uh, you can't, you're not obliged to do anything, um, to, to undertake any tasks that you're told to. Not that that would even need to be written, because if I told you to go and do something, you would evaluate on your own merits whether you would end up doing that. So it's not a dictator, and it's, it doesn't have the final the vote on technical matters and things like this, which is quite confusing to outsiders sometimes. And they're like, well, what, so what do you really do? And it certainly isn't a benevolent dictator for life, like in, um, say, the Python circle and things like that. It's certainly not for life, thank goodness. Um, but yeah, well, it sometimes it feels like it. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. Is it a secretary? I mean, of course, we have a, a project secretary, but sometimes it's like um, a receptionist in a way. You know, people come in and they sort of expect they come to the project and they expect someone to be sort of, sort of on, on the front desk, as it were, um, and to be sort of, you know, oh, connect you with that person, or maybe I'll, um, maybe you need to speak to that person, or um, I'm not really sure who to contact, and they don't perhaps know the exact name of the team to contact. It's like, ah, you want the cloud team, ah, oh, because they were looking for something else. Or something like that. And is it a figurehead? Well, sort of, but again, as it doesn't, as the project leader doesn't. Um, direct in a technical sense, it's not, it can't really sort of forge ahead in, on that kind of angle. It can't say, right, we're putting all our money behind app armor, let's go guys. Like, that's not how it, that's not really how it works. It's not really a, that kind of lead us into battle kind of thing. So it's a sort of mixture of lots of different things all at once. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, which means it's very difficult to judge one's own success and things like that. So what's it like being DPL? How would those kind of questions are, are quite subjective, like what kind of, how do you feel you're doing at it? Or um, those kind of questions are often sort of difficult to answer. So yeah, things like that. Um, to put some stats on the uh, email volume, um, this is current of about 15 minutes ago. In, since uh, my last bits on the DPL in Montreal, uh, I, the leader inbox, this is not counting spam. Um, uh, I, the spam just disappears, you just can't even bother with that. 5,000 emails coming in, which I probably have read them all. Um, how many emails have I sent? Uh, 1,200. Um, and yeah, this is, I'd say, up to date, things like that. Can you calculate how old you get replies? One more time, please. We can calculate how old you get your reply. Oh, oh yeah. calculate the odds of getting a reply there. Yeah. <laughs> if, it, depend, it depends who you are. It depends who you are. Repeat, repeat the joke, please. <laughs> if, a, if a joke needs explaining, it's not funny, right? No, no, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. We'll wait for the uh, microphones to come around next time. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so what's actually been happening in the project since last time I stood up and bored you for an hour? So this is from August the 7th, which was the last bits from the DPL in, in, um, in um, Montreal. So, I mean, uh, let's go through some stats. So um, how many bugs, uh, this is again current about 15 minutes ago. I couldn't get the uh, JavaScript to be live, um, but um, it could have been, it could have been. So um, 33,000 bugs filed, which isn't too bad. Um, I think some of them might even been closed by now. Um, and um, I hope you can see that. Um, anyone on the high score here? <laughs> anyone else? I've, I've managed to. <laughs> yeah, so no, but uh, I think Docker is here, right? Yeah, you've got to take credit for some of those. Brilliant. Um, we've had 40,000 uploads to Unstable, which is probably what I would guess. Um, uh, we've got a little high scoring table here. Um, I don't seem to have snuck into this one. Um, 750 non-maintainer uploads. I'm not really sure what I would have guessed for that or whether you would have guessed for that. So, yeah. Hi, is there a question? No, cool. cool, cool. 
Um, high score table for that. Uh, again, I sneak in there. That wasn't deliberate, but I, I think I just snuck in um, a couple of days ago on, on the top 10. Um, we've had a quarter of a million builds, according to Wanna Build. Um, again, that sort of happens behind our back, so that's kind of fine. And 10,000 auto package test runs. Hopefully, we'll have more of these in the next year. That'd be kind of good. Um, um, great quote, stats are sawdust in the mouth of readers. So like, what's actually, re you can tout numbers all day and, and um, compare this year to last year and have, have really nice graphs, but what's actually sort of been happening in a meaningful sense in the project? So perhaps if we go through month by month. So in August, we had a, a big bumper policy release uh, encapsulating a whole bunch of stuff that had been um, sort of fallen through the cracks or been waiting around. I'd like to thank Sean for pushing forward with that, getting policy out, and I think it became a DD around this time as well. I think so, yeah. Uh, we had a, um, a sprint to deprecate Alioth, um, which I think, was that in Hamburg? I think so, yeah. And um, we also doubled the number of outreachy interns that we are uh, sponsoring this year. So um, that uh, represents a dramatic increase in, the num in, the, um, in our outreach initiatives and things like that. September, we, um, I redeliated the outreach team, um, somehow duplicated the doubling of the outreach interns. Okay. Get doubles, right? Uh, October, uh, saw the release of um, a 9.2 point release, a bug swashing party um, in Austria. Um, and also, um, Debian signed the Free Software Foundation Europe's um, public money, public code. And we also had a cloud sprint, which I believe was in Washington in the Microsoft offices. Is that right? getting a nod somewhere, yeah, which is, yeah, went, went quite well, I believe, uh, and a really nice write-up um, was sent to the announcement list. November saw two mini dev comps. Uh, I put a, um, a prize out for anyone who managed to attend both, and uh, we finally started disabling some old protocols, so um, the FTP protocol, um, on, at least on security, um, on security masters now disabled. GitLab also moved from their contributor license agreement to the certificate of origin, which was uh, blocking on us, uh, sort of moving Salsa to it and things like that. And there was a new FTP team delegation to mirror new members uh, and old members um, becoming um, alumni of that team. December saw Compact Level 11, which I know you were all waiting for. I know I was. Um, it was a great uh, Christmas present for me. And uh, Debian 9.3, another, just another good uh, stable release, no problems there. January um, saw the lovely Spectre meltdown blah happening, which, was, which still seems to be happening. I hear there's a new one yesterday, Net, Net something, Net Spectre. Presumably not named after NetBSD, but uh, we'll, see, uh, we'll see free Spectre soon. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we've all been dealing with that to some degree um, since then. Um, February kicked off Google Summer of Code, and we had a huge number of um, applicants and, um, and re really interesting project proposals, and a really good turnout for people willing to be um, the, what do they call it, the, the mentors of the team, which I thought, I thought was really good. Um, secretary reappointment, we also had um, at least three sprints and things like that throughout the, the month. Um, some of those were attached to FOSDEM, which was again another big um, Debian meetup um, in general, and free software meetup in general, which is really good. Uh, March uh, saw more delegations, um, saw um, Windows, um, Debian come to Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's managed to give that a go yet, but it um, puts us at least on parity with um, at least Ubuntu and things like that on that platform. Uh, we had bug squashing parties in Albania and uh, Curitiba. Another point release, always pretty good. And of course, the most important thing that month was the, um, the general resolution about the DPL title, which I'm sure. Excuse me. One more time, please. Uh, no, this was the DPL title, which got no seconds, but it was to rename the official title of the DPL, of the, the official way of speaking to them as Your Majesty. It did not receive any seconds, unfortunately, but um, it's there on the Curiosa list. April saw a um, secure boot sprint, um, another great report um, sent, and there's some on work ongoing this, um, this week, I believe, on, on secure um, boot. 
a um, box switching party in Bratislava. Uh, May saw a huge turnout in uh, Mini Dev of Hamburg, which was amazing. It's a really, really good, really good event, and really looking forward to that happening next year. Debian was invited to uh, join the KDE Advisory Board. That matches up with uh, our membership on the GNOME Advisory Board. And this is quite a small select group of um, stakeholders that use the, de the operating system. And they try and, and for example, the desktop environment say, we're thinking of, this is what we did over the past year, this is what we're thinking of doing, this is the direction we're sort of going in. Of course, there isn't a top-down leadership um, thing going on there, but it's like, how about, you know, does this work for any of you guys? Does, this, is, does any of your engineering resources want to go into that particular area or this particular area? How can we sort of connect and just stay, um, uh, just, just sort of stay on the same page in, in terms of like the visions for the project and things like that? So that's really good. May also saw the introduction of auto package tests, testing um, migration of packages from unstable to testing, which I think is really good and really promotes their use. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. And uh, re-delegation of the publicity team. June saw the introduction of the G D G P D R. I keep getting the acronym wrong, team, uh, the, the um, European Union um, Data Protection and Privacy Legislation, um, which is all you know, fascinating. Keeps me up at night, I know that. But very important for the project. Um, and thank you very much for all those who helped set that up and are running that because it's a pretty thankless job there, um, and things like that and will the, the number of requests will probably only ramp up and things like that. Um, it's also, um, June also saw the, um, uh, the death, uh, the noble death of Alioth, um, long, live, long live the king um, and its slow SSH terminals. Um, I mean, everyone's on Salsa now and um, I'm really enjoying uh, more on that later, but um, I'm really enjoying the collaboration that I'm seeing now that we're on Salsa and things like that. And there's also a bug squatting party in New York was apparently quite well attended and got a lot of stuff done. July, um, new um, uh, features in the package tracker, another point release, and of course we're now in, in, um, at DevConf 18. So um, yeah, that's sort of the year in, in words at least, things like that. So moving on a little bit, um, what are the future plans? What's coming up for Debian in the next year or so? Uh, the first most important thing is Debian's 25th birthday. Um, we were born on August the 16th, 1993. So we'll be celebrating our 25th birthday next month. So there are some plans afoot, um, but um, get your cake recipes ready, um, birthday cake recipes, whatever, local events, um, perhaps start planning them now, because you know, it'd be good to have a little, little birthday party. Um, January, we'll see our, the first, the, at least from the schedule, the release team schedule, the first of three f freezes that make part of a Debian release. Uh, first, the transition freeze in January, then the soft freeze in February, the hard freeze in March, just to tease you, and then around mid-2019, uh, we're going to have the release of um, Debian Buster, which will be you know, great and very, very much looking forward to that, which I'm sure you all are as well. July, we'll see um, uh, another amazing DevConf in Brazil. Um, I'm seeing a lot of t-shirts already uh, advertising the event and hope to see many of you there. And um, late 2020, early 2021, we'll probably see Bookworm, judging by the, the dates. If you add up the, um, add up the months, that's the kind of thing we're roughly looking at at this point. Things like that. So yeah, how will we get there? How will we get to a good buster? How will we get to a good Bookworm? What kind of things do we need to keep on our radar and things like that? So what, what does Debian need to keep on doing? What does Debian need to, um, what would you call it, double down on? What do we need, yeah, things like that. What are we doing well that we should continue to, to be doing? I think the first thing we should do is stick to our guiding principles. So these are things that have served us well in the past um, throughout a massively changing environment. Uh, going back 25 years, the free software environment was obviously clearly different. Um, I was just born. <laughs> cough, um, things like that. And what served us well has got us here and will continue to keep us where we are in the free software ecosystem. In other words, sort of this linchpin, this reliable base. So yeah, things like that. I mean, it's a bit of a, um, bit of a cliche. Perhaps it's the Godwin's law of the Debian mailing list uh, to say our 
priorities are our users and our free software. And this can be used to justify almost anything. You know, well, our users want that, so we must give it to them. No, okay, but but if we if we stick to this um, guiding principle, I think this will serve us perhaps for another 25 years. And particularly on on the angle of free software, it's if if we start to compromise on that, if we like we like well, you know, we'll we'll just put this thing in here. Um, and we'll compromise on that area. I think it'll really, whilst it might have some short-term benefits, uh, in the long term, um, being keeping to our strength on free software and, and software freedom uh, will really stand us in good stead for the next 25 years. Um, and we should go even further on that. So we should start to look at um, the contrib and non-free areas, uh, try to start to look at firmware and things like that, and just see whether they they are really part of what makes Debian Debian and things like that. Um, things like that, yeah. We should also continue to cultivate technical excellence. So, I mean, technical, um, being good technically, being a great technical distribution that people can rely on is our best defense against um, any, uh, I'm gonna say competitors, but you know what I mean. But um, anyone trying to eat our lunch won't, um, won't really be able to because they just can't compete technically. It's, well, it's, it's Debian, you know. What did you go with? Oh, we went with Debian. Okay, yeah, you know, just got to keep that kind of thing. Um, and it's sort of difficult to criticize any decision that's sort of made on a um, technical basis. Like, well, why did you go with this technology over this technology? It's not because it was funded by X or funded by Y, but um, it's just the better technology. Okay, m m moving on. You know, there's nothing, nothing really to discuss there. So if we continue to do that, um, and maintain our great technical base and you know, releasing when it's ready within reason, um, but not just sort of getting things out the door because they match a calendar or they match the exp expediency of, of um, what we've promised or we always oh, said may, but it's not ready. You know, when we just, yeah, we'll wait, it's good. Number three, be as many as things to as many people as possible. So this is one of Debian's great strengths in that um, it's part of, it underlies so many other derivative distributions, uh, so, uh, including the, all the blends that we have, uh, a whole bunch of embedded devices, the entire Raspberry Pi ecosystem. And we, we're in that position because we are just, uh, I'm not gonna say, yeah, we, we can just be so many things to different people that people can take uh, the, the base of Debian and, and turn it to, and make, make it what they want and apply it to um, their particular use case and things like that. Um, and as long as we continue to not hyper-focus, say, on any one particular area, I think we'll still be able to, to be the basis of many other projects and things like that. And that um, encourages uh, not only new contributions, but also a diverse viewpoints of um, technical input as well. So for example, embedded folks will say, oh, this is really useful in, in, for Debian, and we'll incorporate that. Or people from mainframes, from the, say from the other, um, from top down can say, oh, this is very useful here, and things like that. All the way down, uh, all the way to desktop users and laptop users, et cetera, et cetera, or Debian on phones or Kindles. Um, being as many things to as many people as possible means that we get a wide variety of input and contributions to the distribution. And this will be another reason why we'll still be here in 25 years. And it's sort of viral in, in, in itself as well, yeah. And hold ourselves and others to high standards. So this is not only means technically, I mean in terms of what it really means to be a Debian developer as well. I mean if someone says, oh, he's a DD, you kind of know what that means. Uh, in a technical sense, I mean, you can upload stuff to your machine and root you, but um, it also just is sort of a, mm, you know, sort of a nod that that person is a kind of good person. And we should maintain this very high standard of ourselves and others, in, um, of developers and contributors and things like that. But not, not only that, in a sort of, um, uh, not only in the way we are uh, technically competent in a high standard, but also just in, in dealings with others, you know, so when we, um, speak to other people from other um, from in other free software projects. You know, they're Debian developer. Their their reputation is sort of on the line, and Debian's reputation is on the line. And so we should maintain that kind of high standard, um, and that again will will help us journey to the next 25. And speaking to this, people don't tend to be sort of accidentally successful or um, famous or have high respect. Uh, sort of 
excellence is something that um, you sort of have to practice and do every day and, and focus focus on. So for you, it's not just, oh, well, I'll, I'll sort of behave myself when talking to outsiders, but within the project I'll be not so friendly or amicable. You really have to sort of be that kind of person all the time. Um, you things like that, yeah. Um, collaboration. I mean, naturally, we've been collaborating for the past 24 and a half years, but to, to see through the next five or 25, continue to do so. So, I mean, these are things like um, we typically uh, love to do things upstream first. I mean, local patches are sort of considered a little bit ugly, you know. Um, if something can be done upstream, we'll, we'll poke it upstream instead. You know, it's just how, how things are best done. And that's, that speaks to our innate, and no one really always needs to be told this. So this speaks to our innate viewpoint on collaboration and uh, things along those lines. Um, Salsa is particularly helping this. I know that I, myself, have increased the number of particularly small changes, small but meaningful changes, um, that have been much easier to make with, um, with the, Salsa uh, the Salsa and GitLab system. It's like, oh, this thing is slightly annoying me. And then when you just can create a merge request very quickly, you can see a lot of collaboration um, and it gets accepted very quickly. So the more, more of this that we do, I think the better as well. Things like that. Um, we're also to I think we should also increase the, um, and continue to work with our pure blends and derivative distributions. They're a source of great input and um, um, energy, um, particularly ones that are focused on, say, a particular area, sort of like, a, for example, appliance devices or a, a blend that's um, aimed at a particular um, country or um, culture and things like that. Um, they inject a lot of very positive energy into the project through the, the blend. And so the more we can accum um, not accumulate that, but incorporate that into Debian itself, then, then the better and things like that. Um, what do we need to do better? Um, so, I mean, there are some sort of things that we can immediately, uh, we already know. Um, so we can always do with more uh, manpower on the core teams. Um, they're always understaffed and things like that. Um, yeah, these are things we sort of know about. Uh, we're not... We've got a question. Could we say staff power? Of course we can. Power, of course we can. Thank you. <laughs> My mistake. Um, we're also not so great at making um, archive impacting changes. So if we want to uh, universally change how the... the Debian works as a whole, we're still not good at making those changes. I mean, that's partly good in that we are I'm going to sort of small c conservative in nature. Um, but um, say we wanted to, uh, everything must have an, I make it up, a app armor profile. That's not that easy to get through those kind of changes. That's perhaps a bad example. But um, those kind of changes we need to get better at. And particularly reaching consensus on these archive wide changes, because there's always negatives to any particular um, any change of, of when it affects so many packages and the, and the um, distribution as a whole. Um, even things that people are in broad agreement with, like reproduce or build, no one's really against them, but sort of getting them through and just getting all of the um, dominoes in line, things like that, um, can, 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 be quite, can be quite difficult from a technical and um, sort of procedural administration point of view, simply because it touches so many parts of the project. Uh, we also need to um, address the uh, popularity of the, the new software store, so this is like the, the Flatpak um, hub and Snap things like that. Um, they're good technologies and things like that, but uh, what's the story? How do they fit into Debian, if at all? I mean, we don't really have, I'm not going to say a policy, but we are quite wildly divergent. Some of our users really love them. What are we going to do here? We don't seem to have a, um, we don't really even seem to be talking about um, this particular issue, particularly because it impacts um, security of the system as well, if you're downloading random stuff, but also from um, a free software and principles point of view. Some of this, some of the software available on these stores is not free software, um, and that, that really affects our, um, our guiding principles and our social contract things like that. So it's very important. And this is not just Snap and, and Flathub. This is where you have sort of quasi-stores 
or um, plugin kits. So um, the browsers typically have an extension or application store built into them, which can naturally download any sort of code that you want, uh, again, with security and freedom concerns there. So yeah, uh, these dilute the, the sort of the Debian package as a whole. Um, and we, I think we need to have, uh, we need to be starting to look at these over the next, at least the next year and things like that. But in terms of some concrete things we can all be doing, I mean, one, one thing we can definitely do is to assign credit a little bit better. Um, I mean, we've all had an experience where um, someone has sort of neglected to attribute a patch or, um, or you, you know, you, you spend a lot of work on something and it was sort of dismissed in, a, in, an, in an outright way. This isn't great, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, people don't require credit for work, but um, it certainly helps and things like that. Um, and it establishes sort of trust within a team as well. So if you, if, you, um, if you provide a patch and then everyone's sort of working together, you know, everyone just feels a little bit better about working on things and sort of things get done and um, any further disagreements get smoothed over and things like that. So I think that's very important and something I think we could all be um, addressing a, bit, a little bit better. Um, it's sort of win-win. Um, it's not giving someone, uh, saying thank you for a patch explicitly, um, not only makes them feel good, um, it sort of makes you feel like you're part of the team a bit better. So, I mean, from, even from a selfish point of view, it makes you look good for giving credit and things like that. So even if you can't be convinced it will make someone else feel better, perhaps just do it for yourself, you know, whatever. Um, on this topic, notice people who are particularly lower in self-confidence or, um, um, or who generally don't do that much self-promotion of themselves. So, I mean, the, the loud people are easy to spot and give credit to, but perhaps the, that quiet developer who doesn't, um, who doesn't make a big noise and sends a patch, just say, uh, you know, the, uh, thanking them explicitly will be um, particularly uh, welcome and goes a lot, a lot further than you think. Um, for example, here's my um, very, very first contribution to Debian in 2006. Um, one thing to notice is that I screw up the tags and so I needed to send a separate, so for the BTS, um, the BTS is controlled via email, for people who, who don't know, and you can set some headers at the very top that um, change various things, various attributes of the, the bug. So for example, you can tag whether it has a patch or not. And uh, in my very first contribution, I screw it up. So yeah, it's all good. So I sent this patch along to a, this was a RC bug for the etch distribution. Um, the, X re the etch release, which was around, two, which was released eventually in April 2007, and um, I got a reply back very quickly saying, "Rock on, many thanks. I'll upload this." And um, it eventually ended up in etch. And this, this thank you, and I ended up in the, the change log of of the um, of this particular package um, was sort of meaningless because it was just my name in some not a very important package. But it was amazing, and it just sort of, you know, everything snowballed from there. And throughout that winter, I started to contribute a lot more to Debian and things like that. So it just goes to show that these small, these small thank yous and these small remarks do go a long way and keep people around the project longer. So I really recommend, really highly recommend them. Um, be more empathetic. So empathy is based, I mean, in many ways of, of defining it, but one way is, is it's basically understanding, um, uh, understanding the feelings of others. Now, I, by this, I don't necessarily mean agreeing with them, but at least understanding where, where people are coming from. Um, and um, one thing I like to say is that open conversations, read right, not just read only. Um, so if you're listening to people, if you're reading a mailing list, actually try and read what they're saying. Um, often people, whilst they might be saying one thing on paper, you try, try and sort of step back and, and really appreciate what, where they're coming from, what angle they're coming from, what their history is and things like that. And that speaks to the empathy like that. Um, there's a lot of um, users and developers that uh, are rather unfamiliar with us. And um, sometimes we fail to communicate very well about what the project is really about. Um, a number of conversations, even this dead comp, where uh, people weren't, I th one gentleman wasn't even a, wasn't aware of um, the existence of the unstable distribution, thinking it was something um, 
to something entirely separate from Debian itself and things like this. And so we sort of have this sort of tragedy where we are providing a lot of things to a lot of people, but people aren't aware of them due to perhaps marketing or we have labeled them wrong or we're just not, not describing them in a, in a very good way. Um, be polite when others are not. Um, so our mailing lists are interesting at times. And, um, and sometimes it's very, very tempting to match someone's energy level, shall I put it politically like that. And I think we should all just try and just be a little bit more, um, be more adult sometimes and just, you know, things like that. Um, be, um, yeah, get what I mean there. Another one we could um, do, particularly in teams, is to give, give um, good feedback. Um, this would be great in that we, we want to sort of move the culture in a place where people are, feel freer to make mistakes, particularly mistakes that are reversible. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes you may want to ask whether someone would like to receive feedback first, depending on who they are. Um, a lot of you, I'm not, I'm not gonna say I'm an expert at doing this at all, so there may be better resources for, um, for um, good tips on providing feedback. But um, I mean, to, to focus on the work as much as possible, certainly no, um, I, and I identify, and, identify concrete potential improvements for the future, and of course naturally avoid personal criticism of them as well, so yeah. Um, clearly identifying what they could improve is very important as well, um, because then it provides a, um, an incentive or um, an avenue that they can work out what to do next. I think another thing uh, all perhaps developers could do a bit more of is sort of self-care. Um, Debian, I think, should be fun. Um, it's certainly fun for me, and it, and it should remain fun for people, and people should, um, should be contributing whilst it remains fun for them. Um, as I say in the Constitution, we explicitly say that a person who doesn't want to do a task doesn't have to do it, and that, that really is true. I mean, if, you, if Debian stops being fun for you, why don't stick around? Like, I mean, take a break. I mean, you don't have to martyr yourself on this project. Um, there are people who will step in um, and, and take over the tasks. I mean, that, yeah. Um, and there are other things in life than Debian. Um, and it's really important to keep, keep track of those. Debian, of course, is very important. But um, one shouldn't, uh... <sighs> yeah, I think you'll get what I'm going there. Um, keep a supply of spoons. So spoon theory is this idea that people have a finite number of, of resources throughout a day and, um, and it's enumerated by this idea of you have a number of spoons and you can spend them on different tasks. Um, something, um, some tasks might um, cost more spoons than others, so a difficult interaction might cost you a number of spoons. And people start the day with a different number. So um, if you have a good sleep, you might start with more or if you're suffering from an illness, you might have more, or you're just low on them generally for whatever reason. Yeah, so um, just you know, keep some spare and um, spend them in Debian wisely. I mean, there seems to be a little bit of an irony that the swag bag for this conference contains a spoon. I'm not sure whether um, that was deliberate or not, but I certainly found it amusing from this point of view. Um, but it, at least it included chopsticks as well. Um, and sometimes just let it go. I mean, we've all had these flame wars or whatever emails that we've got, and they've just been bugging us. You know, you walk to work, and you're just thinking, ah, ah, ah. sometimes you just have to just, you know, just leave it in a box. Maybe you take it out of the box later, but just sometimes let it go. It's, it's, it's only Debian. It's only this massively important project. But it is only Debian sometimes. Another thing we could do, certainly do better is adopting a sort of growth mindset. Um, the stereotypical Debian developer is sort of slightly stuck in their own little world um, and is often quite dismissive of, um, often quite dismissive of new things. And this is great from uh, Debian's point of view sometimes because, as I say, we're a sort of small C conservative operating system and we only release when it's ready and we, are, might, we, we might be slow to adopt technologies. Um, sometimes relative other distributions, but we adopt them when they have been proven and um, hopefully been proven and we can actually justify them from that point of view. But we think we should 
at least keep an open mind about new things. One quote I came across a little while ago is, if you find yourself showing contempt for technology or community, you probably don't understand what they're all about. Um, I'm not going to name any particular technologies here to put some examples on, but um, you often see whole categories of, of things dismissed just out of hand. Perhaps there are good reasons for doing so, but they've just been dismissed out of hand. Um, and maybe these people are coming from a different angle that we just don't understand yet or we haven't, haven't been exposed to yet. Um, and this is not only in terms of, say, programming languages, but in terms of entire technology stacks or industries and things like that. So just keeping an open mind about these things will certainly mean that we don't ever get stuck uh, where we are. And as I say, there's this contradiction in Debbie in between being slow and conservative, being good, um, but it's also one of our weaknesses as well. So yeah, um, great um, few. Thank you so much for entertaining my rambling for the past 45 minutes. Um, thank you very much. And um, um, yeah, we've got a, I think we've got a few, I'd like to thank you again for inviting me here. And I think we've got a, um, quite a few minutes for some questions if there are any. So yeah, thank you. We have one. Hello. 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 Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to DevConf. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, from your stats, that you, I, I was missing how many new developers have joined the Debian project? Because I see like many old names there, like in the list. Are there new people coming in or it's not? Or do you know anything about this? Well, there's certainly um, new people coming in. And it was terribly remiss of me not to include that number. Because that is obviously an extremely important number. Maybe room for improvement. Room for improvement, always, yeah. Thank you, Thank you for your work and taking care of all, all the email. And all that. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Um, is there someone from front desk that can give a number on that? Maybe someone can find it on nmdivine.org and shout it out in a few seconds. No. Great. Any other questions? Oh, Sledge. Hi, Chris. Hi. So, what do you think are the things that Debian should probably focus on most in the next few years? What are we not doing that we really should be? I think we should probably be looking at some of the adjacent, I'm going to say competitors, and, and seeing what their users are, the, the motivations of their users and things like that. So you see a lot of people, um, oof, what was I encountering earlier, just earlier today? People, a lot of people choose distributions on how good they look. Like, that's pretty shallow. Um, but we should try and see where people are coming from from that point of view. Um, but that's just one example of many. So I think we can learn a lot from not necessarily derivatives, but um, we should look for the success of, of other distributions, things like that. I mean, I, I spoke to some of the things we, we could be doing slightly better, but that's probably not exactly addressing your question. Mm. Well, and again, it's difficult as, as a GPL because it's not like a, a technical thing, like, oh, we should adopt technology X over Y. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Of course, I'm asking you a hard question. You are, you are. Um, and putting me on the spot, and I'm prevaricating. <laughs> That's a fair answer. Yeah. I mean, we, we should, I think basically just keeping an open mind and just keeping, uh, you know, as long as we know our options and, uh, and we are evaluating them sensibly, I think that's what we should be doing. And we seem to have a fairly good process for doing that. Um, although it does require a volunteer, um, a willing volunteer, and an able volunteer to sort of spearhead any particular initiative. So, you know, if they come with an idea, they need to say, I mean, to go back to AppArmor, they need to come with a proposal and say, let's try this. And that can be evaluated on its own terms. So that's a, if we could get around not requiring that, 
somehow that would be that would be good because then it wouldn't need mm. um, I'm not going to say a blocker, but it wouldn't need a sort of stakeholder to sort of own that because that's obviously quite a difficult cool. thing. Yeah. Okay, Thank and you. then the second question, I guess, is probably a a common thing that people fear every year. So you've already been elected DPL twice. How do you think about a third term? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> it's, I, I knew Steve was attending, you see, and he has a bit of a habit of asking this question. Um, I, it really does depend right now. Um, often I'm quite myopic about, it's often you know, the next email in the inbox and it's very difficult to look past that, yet alone the next week, the next DebConf, the next DPL term. So I have, genuinely, I have not even thought about it beyond making this slide. Um, <laughs> and of course, I wouldn't want to run against you. Um, so yeah. Um, it's certainly something to think about, and a lot of it's and particularly my, when I decided to rerun last year, was based on how well I thought I had done. And I can only really evaluate that nearer the, nearer the time. Um, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi. Not a question, more of a comment. I have numbers for you on new contributors. Thank you. So, 26 uploading DDs, uh, two non-uploading DDs, and 42 Debian maintainers added in the last year. For, okay, nice. So, so DMs by far and away the, the majority. Nice, nice. I think that speaks to the success of the, of the um, DM process. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> great. Um, again, unless it's, that's it. I'm being waved at by our video team. So thank you very, very much. Um, Everyone knows my face now, so I can't hide at the conference anymore. Um, so if you, have, if, you have any, if you ever have anything you want to discuss, you can email me at leader at debian.org, or you can catch me um, around the conference. I'm here all week and a little bit beyond that. And again, thank you very much, and uh, speak to you all soon.